Now please turn to me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 28 through 30. You say, when are we going to start our Christmas celebration? That's tonight, okay? Come tonight. You'll be fine. Tonight. It's going to be great. So, but for now, Ephesians 4, 28 through 30. The letter of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians living in the wretchedly pagan city of Ephesus, the capital city of Asia Minor. Paul wrote this while he was under house arrest in Rome, and he wrote it to lay a solid doctrinal foundation for these believers so they could then live out those doctrines for the glory of God. We're now in the middle of the application section of this letter. The call, now that we are saved, this, to use our gifts within the church so we can all be growing and maturing in our faith and thus glorifying God with our lives in full measure. So as Paul said, put off the old man, put that away. In other words, stop living like a non-believer and put on the new man day by day by day and live like a Christian is called to live because this is who you now are in Christ, right? Last week, Paul began to show us what the new man looks like what the saved soul looks like, and it's all very practical. Look, he says, now that you're saved, stop lying. Tell the truth. (laughs) Be angry, but don't sin, and don't harbor anger in your heart. Because sin like that gives a place for the devil to work, and that's never wise. See, it's all very, very practical. Living out our faith, living like a new man, a new person is called to live. Paul continues to show us what the new man looks like in today's passage. Verse 28, let's look. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption." Now remember, Paul's already told us that when we were saved, we put off the old man and we put on the new man. Done deal, right? Done deal. We are now saved. We are now justified. We are now forgiven. It is done. It's happened already. That said, we also know that putting off the old man is something that's to continue on throughout our lives because guess what? We're not in glory yet. (laughs) Not yet. So put off put on, put off, put on, put off, put on, continually, day by day, until glory. In today's passage, we see five more marks of the new man or woman in Christ. First, steal no longer. (laughs) Steal no longer. Now, you might think that stealing isn't a problem amongst Christians, but we might need to think again about that one. (laughs) The word steal is from the Greek word klepto, and it means to take by stealth, to take someone else's property secretly, without permission. It seems that this was quite the problem in Ephesus at the time, not only before these Ephesians were saved, but even after they were saved. Look, Paul puts this instruction in the present tense. That means that it's now happening amongst those people that Paul was writing to. It means that this sin was still being committed by the members of the Ephesian church. We look at this and we say, no, no, Christians don't steal. Really? Really? Some commentators say how this was a cultural thing in Ephesus, and they say that it really wasn't thought of as being all that bad of a thing at that time. But I I don't really buy that. Stealing is a massive problem amongst the unsaved in every society, and it's also a problem, I believe, amongst many Christians, and the call is to stop it. See, now that they put off the stinking garments of the old man and they put on the new garments of Christ, they have access, we have access to a new power, right, that allows us to obey Paul's commands more and more as we live in daily dependence on the Holy Spirit who resides in us. We can overcome. We can take spiritual ground for the glory of God. One said, they were once spiritual kleptomaniacs But now, in Christ's garments, they are to cease this sin. And that's correct. You may say, is it really that big of a problem? Yeah. John MacArthur notes that in the past several decades, shoplifting has grown alarmingly, and a large percentage of it is being done by employees. 
In some larger stores, up to a third of the price of merchandise is used to cover theft losses. In one 20-year study, it was found that 30% of the population will steal, not only if the opportunity arises, but they'll also create the opportunity whenever they possibly can. 40% will steal if there's little danger of getting caught, and only 30% of people won't steal at all. And I believe that the number would go down if there was no chance of getting caught. It, I believe this really is a problem. I re, it really is a problem. One seven-year-old article was titled, The Five-Finger Discount, 35 Facts About Shoplifting in America. Here's a couple of lowlights. I won't list all of them. It's estimated that there are currently 27 billion shoplifters in the U.S. today when the article was written, which means one in 11 people steal from stores or retailers. I think, again, I think it's more than that, but it's estimated there are between 330 and 440 million individual cases of shoplifting every year, which comes to 1.2 million shoplifting incidences daily or 50,000 every hour. Experts cite that there's no uh, average shoplifter profile. Men and women shoplift about equally. 25% of shoplifters are kids, which means that 75% are full-grown adults. One study by Columbia University concluded that shoplifting was actu actually more prevalent among people with higher education and higher income, which made them conclude that there were more psychological factors and less financial motivation that made people steal. You know, it's called sin. 73% of shoplifters don't plan to steal anything in advance. It just happens, happens once they get into the store. What's the conclusion of that? People steal when the opportunity arises and they think that they're going to get away with it. Retailers and businesses around the world spend about $26.8 billion a year to stop shoplifters and thieves, a dollar amount that has grown at a rate of almost 10% per year in the last five years. Again, I believe this is quite a problem. I came across another article about theft in San Francisco. The writer said this, Soon after moving to San Francisco in 2016, I walked into a Walgreens in North Beach to buy an electric toothbrush. As I was paying for it, a man walked into the store, grabbed a handful of beef jerky, and walked out. I looked over at the employee who shrugged. Then I went to Safeway next door for some groceries, and I saw a man stuffing three bottles of wine into a backpack and walking casually toward the exit. On his way out, he bagged some snacks. No one seemed to care. Five years later, he says, the shoplifting epidemic in San Francisco has only worsened. Walgreens has had to close 17 stores, largely because the scale of the thefts has made business untenable. Why? And why, especially in San Francisco? Here's what the article said, because he said this, San Francisco in particular has a hands-off attitude, and if there are no consequences for their actions, then you invite the behavior. And that, right there, is the attitude of the unsaved world. And generally speaking, if they can get away with it, then why not take it, even if it doesn't belong to you? Look what happens when a mob forms and people are allowed to loot and to take things that don't belong to them. What happens? They loot and they take things that don't belong to them because they think that there's not going to be any consequences for it. This is the way of the world, and the stats prove it. But certainly this isn't a problem in the church, right? Right? Well, it was in Ephesus, and it probably hits closer to home than we might think. How about this? Padding expense accounts. Reporting more hours than we worked. Failing to report income to the IRS. Petty theft, taking some of your dad's money off the dresser, reneging on a, uh, on a debt, not paying fair wages, pocketing what a clerk overpays in change, that's all called stealing. And so there's really no end to the ways that we can steal, but again, stealing is a sin, and it's to have no part in the life of the new person in Christ. So stop stealing if you are, and if you're not, hey, never do it, because stealing is something that Christians put off and put out of their lives. All right, that leads to the second mark of the new man, work hard. So put off stealing and you instead put on hard work, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good. The word for work here is a basic word for laboring or working 
in contrast to idleness or laziness. Working with your hands doesn't mean that only manual labor is valid, but instead, Paul is speaking of hard work for gain as opposed to gaining by stealing. So while a robber uses his hands to gain something that isn't rightfully his, the Christian is to use his hands for honest gain. What's a Christian to labor and work for? It says that which is good, which speaks of that which is moral, that which is beneficial. So instead of stealing like you used to, work hard at a good job, work hard at a job that supports you and your family in a manner in which God would be glorified. A job that supports you. A job that honors God. Some jobs aren't good. Don't do those jobs. Those jobs which no Christian who loves the Lord should do, don't do that. But aside from that, work hard for the glory of God and also so that you don't have to steal. <laughs> Look, God created humans to work. The first instruction God gave Adam was to work to tend the Garden of Eden. So work was given before sin entered the world. And therefore, work is a part of God's perfect creation. See, Work wasn't the result of the fall. No, the fall only made work more difficult. Tending Eden was designed to be a pleasant and rewarding job for Adam. And he certainly would have loved caring for the garden and he would have found it fulfilling and purposeful because work was designed to do that. Look, work is the way we provide for our basic needs and help others who may be unable to work. And we're going to see that in the next point. So we should embrace the work that God has given us to do, and we should express gratitude to Him that we have the ability to provide for ourselves and for our families. As Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. So again, work hard as unto the Lord. See, laziness, which is the avoidance of work, is condemned in Scripture. People who neglected to provide for their families were condemned by the early church, 1 Timothy 5.8. Paul gave instructions that those who refused to work should not be allowed to eat, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Jesus himself worked, and so work was designed by God as man's earthly occupation, and it's a very good thing. So again, put on hard work. Work hard, exalt Christ, do good, Work with your hands, even if it means that you have to sit at a desk all day, and do it well for the glory of God because He's watching. It's quite an issue today, especially now. It's quite an issue today. People don't want to work, generally speaking. Give me free stuff, right? I really like free stuff and I don't want to work. Give me free stuff. That's a major problem today. What happens when people don't have to go to work? Generally speaking, this is what I've observed. <laughs> They get depressed, they get up late, they watch TV all day, they play video games all day and all night, or they waste time on many other things, and they lose a sense of purpose in their lives. Note that while this statement is here so that you can earn enough money so that you don't have to steal, but so you can actually be generous with others in need, we're going to get to that. Look, not every job's a paid job, right? I mean, stay-at-home moms work hard. Anybody? Right? Right? I know some retired people who work hard every day doing things to bless God and to bless others. That's very good because God made us for work and it's a good thing. And Christianity has always stood up for the dignity of work and of labor while the godless are characterized by slackness and laziness. And laziness isn't a good quality. One said, our idle days are Satan's busy days. Another our footprints in the sands of time are never made by sitting down. <laughs> Another, there's never yet been a person in our history who led a life of ease whose name is worth remembering. And then there's this by Spurgeon. It's an abomination to let the grass grow up to your knees and do nothing toward making it into hay. God never sent a man into the world to be idle. And that's absolutely right. Instead, the call, work hard, to make your money, to survive, yes, so that you don't have to steal anymore, yes, but also for your own good, for your own good and for the glory of God. That leads to the third mark of the new man, to be generous. Look, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good. Why? That he may have something to give him 
who has need. The word that introduces a purpose clause. And this tells us that instead of stealing, the call is to work hard. Why? So that you can make money, so that you can then be able to share with others who are needy. So as opposed to the old man who's a taker, the new man is a hard worker and a giver. Look, God himself is a giving God, (laughs) or don't we know it? And his generosity is evidence all around us. I mean, he generously gives us blessing upon blessing upon blessing beyond measure. Sun, rain, good food, wonderful people around us, vivid colors, beautiful music, and so many things, and they all come from the generous hand of a gracious God. Above all, God demonstrated his ultimate act of generosity when he offered his son as a sacrifice to atone for the sin of every believer. So yeah, our God is an extremely generous God, and his children should be generous like him. And the question is, are you? That means that we think beyond ourselves, right? That we don't just consider the things of this present fading life, but we consider the next life. That we have a heart for those who have less than we have, that we are generous with the blessings that we have, generous to others around us. The call is to liberate ourselves from covetousness and to work hard so we can generously share with others. Look, Christians, new men and women, are generous. That's a fact. That's a fact. That's the way it should be. They aren't stingy. They aren't covetous. No, they're generous because they live for things beyond this fading life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul talks about the churches in Macedonia and how generous those churches had been in their giving to the struggling Christians in Jerusalem. What's amazing is that those churches in Macedonia were very poor churches themselves. In fact, those Christians in Macedonia were going through deep and intense poverty, horrible trials, and terrible afflictions, and yet... It says in 8.3 that they gave not only according to their ability, but they gave beyond their ability. Why and how? Because it says they first gave themselves to God, and that's the key, right? Give yourself to God, and then it's going to prompt you to give generously back to God and then to others. And that's a mark of a new man or a new woman in Christ. They don't take. No, they freely give. They're generous. See, as lovers of God, generosity should be a natural outflow in light of everything that he's given to us. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 shows us what Christian generosity ought to look like when it says this. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, For God loves a cheerful giver, and there it is right there. You reap what you sow, right? And the question is, what do you want to reap? That's that's the question. What do you want to reap? Sow a little, reap a little, sow a lot, reap a lot. All right, so what do you want to reap? You say, okay, I get the principle, but what does it mean? Well, when Paul talks about sowing and reaping, he's simply saying this. When you give to God, God promises that you will be blessed for it in return, eternally blessed for it by God himself. Maybe that'll be seen when you look around and see the many souls who are coming to to the Lord through the ministry that you support. Maybe it'll be seen when you look around and see how the truly needy are indeed being taken care of by the church because they're able to do that because of your generous giving. Maybe it'll be seen only when you stand before God and he shows you what your generosity went for and how God used it to affect his kingdom. That's an incredible thought. But reaping time will come. That's a fact. Reaping time will come. Matthew 6.10 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so we see that When you generously give things that are honoring and pleasing to God in this life, self, money, time, talents, things like that, to God and to others for the glory of God, those things are storing up treasures in heaven, treasures in the next life. So generosity not only blesses others, but it also blesses your God who is watching and it blesses you, the giver. 
See, I think too many Christians today are way too worldly minded. <laughs> we think way too much about the things of this life only. <laughs> we forget that it's this really isn't our home and we live too many of us live like this is all that there is. So what do we do? We spend and live for this life way too much. So we buy houses and cars and toys and things and build up our barns and we fill those barns up and we forget that all this stuff will burn away and rot. That doesn't mean that having a nice house or a car or, or, or nice things is bad. That's not what it means. It just means that we need to evaluate what life we are truly focused on the most today. Are you a generous person? Would you say that you give generously to the Lord and His church and others, time, talent, gifts, and so on? Is God pleased? Do you give generously to others in the name of the Lord? That's a mark of a, a, of a new person in Christ. That's a mark of a, of a true Christian. Not long ago, a rich man died. One of his friends said to another, what did he leave? The friend replied, all of it. We need to remember that what we sow into this life will fade away, but what we sow into the next life will last forever. Wisdom says, therefore, to be generous, to give freely, to give graciously, to bless others, to not withhold from God or from people who have needs, to help the hurting, to help the needy, to show them the gracious love of the Lord. That's a mark of a new man in Christ. Fourth, the new man speaks words that edify. Verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. The word corrupt describes that which is rotten, disgusting, foul, putrid, and worthless. The word was often used to describe spoiled fish or rotten food. And the call here is very clear, isn't it? That this kind of language is rotten and smelly, and it must be taken off like an old stinking garment. See, a rotten mouth is a part of the old self that needs to be stripped away when a person becomes a Christian. One said, the garment of a rotten mouth must be taken off and thrown into the fire. And he's absolutely right. Look, halitosis is a condition of chronic bad breath. And spiritual halitosis is indeed a reality that must be put off by those who love God. See, rotten words and rotten conversations are a part of the unsaved world, but they shouldn't be a part of us who love Christ. So, what are these corrupt words? Obviously, this is speaking of conversation that's filthy and suggestive, right? Off-color jokes profanity, dirty stories, cussing, swearing, and the like. Obviously, it includes that. However, this also probably includes any form of conversation that's frivolous, empty, idle, and worthless. So Paul's con condemning any use of speech that is morally unhealthy, that suggests impure thoughts, light views of sin, irreverence towards God, or that trifles with serious things. Paul's going to deal with obscene and vile language in chapter 5, verse 4. So this is more, I believe, of a general statement for us in Christ to talk like lovers of God should talk and not like the world who doesn't care about Christ and about the things that honor Christ. A while back, it became popular for preachers to cuss from the pulpit. Anybody shocked by that? Did you already know that? If you didn't know that, you should be shocked by that. <laughs> they, the preacher, preachers cussing from the pulpit became a popular thing. They thought it made them cool. They thought it made them edgy. But in the end, it just made them sinful. There's nothing godly about that. God cares about your language. God cares about your conversation. God cares about the words that come out of your mouth. And if He cares, then so should we care. So how then does God want us to talk? Look what it says. The new man is called to speak that which is good for necessary edification. Edification is an interesting word because it comes from two Greek words that have been put together. Oiko, which means house, and dome, which means build. The word refers to uh, the process of building or of construction. And here, it speaks of spiritually building others up in the Lord. So what's the call? This, to speak words that build people up 
instead of tearing them down spiritually. Talking about truthful words, biblical words, kind words, encouraging words, loving words, gentle words, Christ-like words, and so on. Note that words that edify don't always make people feel good about themselves because what people who are indulging in sin need are words of truth and words of conviction spoken in love, yes, but spoken truthfully as well. See, the aim is to help people grow in Christ. And the truth spoken in love sometimes hurts, but that is what is necessary for edification. That is what they need to hear. That's the thing that's going to build them up in the Lord. So it's not always touchy-feely, but words that edify are truthful, godly, Christ-like, and they help people draw closer to Christ. What does this practically look like? How about this? Talk to people as if Christ is in the room with you when you're talking. How about that? Say nothing that would offend Christ. Say things that would honor Christ and speak as if He was there because guess what? He is, right? Paul also adds this, that it may impart grace to the hearers. What does that mean? Grace means unmerited favor. That tells us that our words and our conversations should express God's grace to people so that people are greatly blessed after talking with us. Christ teaches that even our enemies should be blessed by our speech. In fact, we are called to bless those who curse us. And grace is a good summary of how people should feel after talking to us in Christ. They're so kind. They're so forgiving and gracious and godly. And I'm so blessed and built up after talking to them. That's the idea. So our speech should show forth grace, God's grace to people. And that's how the new man talks. And our speech as Christians should be edifying, appropriate, and gracious. See, Christians aren't allowed to say whatever we desire simply by rationalizing that we don't cuss. The biblical standard is that if it doesn't build up and benefit, then it's not worthy to be said. Is anybody besides me convicted of this? How convicting is this? So yeah, we're to be concerned for what we say and think and do because of how these things affect us and others because as new men and women... God has rescued us by His amazing grace, and and we love Him. And love now compels us to honor Him with every part of our lives. But now, look, the grace is driven outward toward others because our words are an instrument of God's grace, and they show people what God is like. Therefore, we are to speak only what builds up and benefits others because, guess what? Our lives are not our own but they are meant to show forth the one who indwells us. And so our words as Christians are very important. The new man and woman speaks words that edify. What about you? An unknown poet writes this. A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate instill. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. Again, what about you? Fifth, the new man won't grieve the Holy Spirit. Verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That obviously flows out of what we just looked at, how corrupt speech ties in with grieving the Holy Spirit, as does all sin. But first, who is the Holy Spirit? We know the answer, right? The Holy Spirit is God. The word holy there is a dead giveaway, for only God is truly holy in and of Himself. Also, look, He is the Holy Spirit of God, which means that He is God's Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the Trinity. See, according to the Bible, we worship one God, who eternally exists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, each equally deserving love, worship, and obedience from the people of God. The Bible is clear that the Father is God, and that's not a problem for most. The Bible is also very clear that Jesus is God, and that's a problem for some, but it shouldn't be because it's biblical. In Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus is called the mighty God. John 1, 1, the word Jesus was and is God. 
In John 20, 28, Thomas calls Jesus his Lord and his God. Titus 2, 13 tells us that Jesus is our great God and Savior. I could go on and on. But the Bible's very clear that Jesus is God. And then we find that the Bible is very clear that the Holy Spirit is God. Hebrews 9, 14 tells us that the Holy Spirit is eternal, a divine attribute. Psalm 139, 7 through 10 tells us that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, another divine attribute. Luke 1.35 shows us that the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, another divine attribute. 1 Corinthians 2.10 tells us that the Holy Spirit is omniscient, yet another divine attribute. Psalm 104.30 ascribes creation to the Holy Spirit because He's God, the Creator. In 1 Corinthians 12.4-6 it says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all them in all men. So spirit, Lord, and God are used synonymously because they can be one God in three distinct persons. Again, we could go on and on, but the Bible is very clear. The spirit is God, and this is very important for us to understand. See, the Holy Spirit is not a force. He is not an it. No, he is a he. He is God. He's a person. And we should love Him because He's doing a great work even now for us on our behalf. Okay, what does He do? Well, at salvation, He comes and He indwells every believer. He is our divine helper who gives us power for living the God-honoring life. Power to glorify God, power to witness for God, power to fight sin, power to be bold, power to be strong, power to arrive safely home, which we all in Christ will certainly do. And we can do these things more and more. We can because of His indwelling Spirit who lives in us. What a gift. God, think of this, God lives in you as a Christian. In you. Look what Paul says. He seals us. The Holy Spirit does this. He seals us for the day of redemption. How good is that? That means that the Holy Spirit is God's seal on his people. That the Holy Spirit is his claim on us as his very own. The word for seal in the Greek denotes ownership. The word was originally used as a business term that referred to sealing up a building. See, in order to guarantee property against theft, a seal was placed on it, a special mark, a, a sort of brand like branding livestock. Also, when a merchant bought a sack of grain, a seal would be placed on the sack until full payment could be made. The seal was a guarantee of that coming payment. Later, the seal became a mark of royalty. Any communication from the crown was sealed by the king. After dabbing hot wax on any official document, the king would seal it by pressing his ring into the wax. Before long, the engraved ring was called a seal. So seals were used to make something secure, to serve as a guarantee of the correctness of the contents, and to indicate authenticity, and also to indicate ownership. And here, Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit is God's seal on us, his people, guaranteeing, you hear that? Guaranteeing what is to come for us, our redemption. Redemption means to buy back and to deliver by release of a payment of a ransom. Well, Christ is the one who gave his life as the payment, the ransom price for every believer. And the Holy Spirit is in you to guarantee that that has indeed happened. And it's a guarantee of what lay ahead for every one of us in Christ. See, the gift of the Spirit to believers is the down payment of on our heavenly inheritance, and again, it's guaranteed for us. All true Christians have the Spirit of God living in them, and therefore, all true Christians will arrive in glory, and they will receive their eternal inheritance, and that is a given, that is a fact. So you say, John, does that mean that we believe in eternal security? That when a believer is saved, that he cannot lose that salvation if it's a real, true salvation. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Because that's what this verse clearly teaches. When a person is truly saved, that person gets indwelt by God the Spirit who seals us, who marks us as his own, and who guarantees, that's a solid statement right there, 
our future inheritance according to what Paul already said in chapter 1. That is ironclad. He lives in us. God lives in us. And look, look, we can grieve him. Doesn't that break your heart? The word grieve, think about this, has a basic idea of grief, sorrow, pain, and distress. Think hard about that. It's very, very serious. There's a certain tenderness about this word, isn't there? We can only grieve someone who loves us, right? One said, the neighborhood brats don't grieve us, but our naughty children do. (laughs) And so we can grieve him because he loves us so very much. Think about that. We hold a special place of nearness and dearness to God, specifically to God the Holy Spirit. He loves us intensely. He lives in us. He is always with us. He is here to help us through everything, everything that we go through. He sealed us and he can be grieved by us. And that reality should cause us to never, ever, ever want to grieve him in light of who he is and in light of what he's done. I mean, he's been central to everything good that's ever happened to us. He's the one who drew us to God. He's the one who regenerated us and opened our blind eyes and gave us life. He's the one who helps us day by day. He's the one who's intimately involved in every single aspect of our lives. And the last thing we should ever want to do is grieve him. But we can and we do. What grieves him? Sin grieves him, right? Any sin that's already been mentioned, including sinful words, but any and all sin in the lives of God's beloved children grieves him. He's the Holy Spirit. And anything unholy in us grieves him and it brings sorrow to his heart. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do those things less that grieve him. Battle sin with more fervor in light of this, see? And and when you do mess up and grieve him, flee back to him immediately, confess that sin and lay it at his feet, and then move forward with the God-pleasing, spirit-pleasing life. That's the call. Look, you can grieve him when you gossip. You can grieve him when you slander. You can grieve him when you indulge that sin. You can grieve him when you cuss and you use those nasty words. You can grieve him when you harbor harbor anger and refuse forgiveness. You can grieve him when you tell lies. You can grieve him when you look at those things that you shouldn't look at. You can grieve him when you're not when you aren't the spouse that God calls you to be. You can grieve him when you live like the unsaved world around you. You can grieve him when you walk in spiritual mediocrity instead of living passionately for his glory the God whom you love sin grieves him think about that and our call is to fight sin fervently to battle it passionately to stay radically faithful to continue on in him no matter what to repent often to stay in the word in prayer and in fellowship and to be pursuing God's glory in our lives because that matters And we can do it with God's Spirit living in us more and more and with His powerful Word available to us. So how about this? Don't grieve Him, but rather, how about this? Be well-pleasing to Him. How about that? Please Him in every way. See, while we can grieve Him, the good news is that we can also please Him, which is the ultimate. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul says, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to God. And that's the motive right there. That in light of who we are and what he's so graciously done for undeserving us, in light of the hope that we have, in light of the fact that we've been rescued from eternal wrath and and have been given the promise of eternal glory, in light of the fact that we have peace instead of eternal turmoil, joy instead of eternal torment, God instead of Satan, life instead of eternal dying, love (coughs) instead of eternal separation, meaning and purpose instead of nothing worth living for except to eat, drink, and be merry for a while and then die and go to hell. In light of all that, let's make it our aim to be well-pleasing to this amazing God that we love so very much. Our beloved, soul-saving God. Instead of grieving Him. Are you a God-pleaser today? Or a God-griever? 
Lord, help us to be God-pleasers here more and more, compelled by our passionate love for him. The new man seeks to glorify and please God, putting off the old stinking garments of the flesh and daily putting on the new garments that reflect him and his glory in us. Lord, help us to look like new men and new women more and more and more because our God is indeed a worthy God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are worthy and we love you. And I pray that we would see that and understand that more and more, that we would see these things that please you, that we would be fully aware of those things that grieve you, and that we would put off the things that grieve you and put on the things that please you more and more. Thank you, Lord, for saving us, for indwelling us, for guaranteeing what remains and what, what, what's soon coming for us. Until glory, Lord, help us to continue putting on these things and living the God-pleasing life. We love you. May love compel us now. May we encourage each other in these things for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you and hope to see you tonight. It should be a great night.